Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, Professor Honora O'Neill. Welcome to Sky Lounge Prince in the heart of Antwerp for the conferral of the 2021 Honorary Degree in Arts. My name is Anke Verschuren. I'll be your hostess this afternoon in this impressive location. Normally, I would have been able to say those words a year ago in the Rector Danis Lecture Hall. But the coronavirus decided otherwise. We are delighted that we can now go ahead with the ceremony this afternoon in this way. Honorary Dr. O'Neill's masterclass is scheduled for the autumn, but today Professor Walter van Herk, chair of the Department of Philosophy, will give us a fascinating introduction to ethics, trust and poetry. Then we will proceed to the conferral of the honorary degree. But first, I would like to give the floor to Professor Luc Durlot, Dean of the Faculty of Arts. Lady O'Neill, dear rector, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, the donning of masks and the smell of disinfectant may be a constant reminder of the situation that we presently find ourselves in. The format of this ceremony may well be unprecedented, Yet this is nonetheless, and in every sense of the word, a festive day for the Faculty of Arts of the University of Antwerp. Roughly every three years, our faculty can propose an honorary doctor. The five departments take turns in nominating an outstanding scholar. And today, Professor Honora O'Neill, we are proud to welcome you among our honorary doctors. It is a moment of celebration for us. It is also a moment that we take stock of what, what we stand for, a moment to decide which outstanding colleague we consider a role model. The choice made by our colleagues from the philosophy department proved more than fully merited, even more than inspired. It was prophetic. Within weeks from putting their proposal on the table, our societies were plunged into a profound crisis, the likeness of which had not been seen since the Spanish flu pandemic that raged through the world between 1918 and 1920. Like its early 20th century predecessor, this crisis has mercilessly bared weaknesses in the fabric of society. In conjunction with the transformations wrought by social media, it has made clear that trust, trust in governments, trust in science, trust in news, trust in vaccines, is by no means obvious in today's world. And trust, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the central topics in the works of Professor Honora O'Neill. The following speakers will elaborate on this. I therefore pass the word to Professor Walter van Herk, Chair of the Department of Philosophy. Professor O'Neill, dear colleagues and hon honored guests, it was easy to find consent among the members of our department to the proposal of our colleague Geert van Ekert to nominate you as an honorary doctor. Your original way of looking at and applying the Kantian heritage in philosophy and your focus on such topics as trust and trustworthiness convinced everyone in a moment's time. Trust is not only a topic in ethics, although it is its home ground, so to speak, but also in epistemology and even in my own discipline, the philosophy of religion. Some might think that humans are trusting beings because we have no time to check everything and everyone. Life is too short for an exhaustive attempt at doubting and subsequently proving the reliability of everything and everyone we trust. That view however, reduces trust to a matter of pragmatics and neglects the deep roots trust has in human nature. Doubting and rejecting, questioning and investigating are only possible because many things aren't doubted but trusted. In ethics, trust seems to be the precondition of any valuable relation between persons. As such, feeling one isn't trusted is a tragic discovery. Perhaps not as tragic as showing oneself a lack of trust where it was expected. And what happiness to find trust where it was not expected. 
Since the Irish are, are noted for having a poetical character, it seems a good idea to present you a story by an Antwerp poet born in 1884. His name is Jan van Erle. Jan van Erle wrote his childhood memories in a booklet entitled Slumbering Bourgeoisie, Childhood Memories of a Solitary Man. In these memories, I was struck by the following anecdote. Jan is in a boarding school in a small village on the left bank of the Scheldt River. One afternoon, he got permission to go to the toilet, but being in a strange mood, he didn't feel like returning to his classroom. This is what happens in his own words. When crossing the grounds to turn to the hall, I noticed that a little door that gave entrance to a vegetable garden was open. I entered the vegetable garden without a specific intention, except curiosity, and walked along the vegetable beds surrounded with currant bushes. At the end of the garden, there was another door. What would be behind it? The door wasn't even locked. I opened it carefully and found myself on a narrow field path that ran along the backside of the boarding school. There was no one to be seen, and I just stood there. Suddenly, it came into my thoughts that I wasn't allowed to be here and that I would be punished, humiliated, and ridiculed in front of my fellow sufferers. I didn't want to return anymore. I didn't think about fleeing, and I certainly didn't think about returning to my parental home. I just wanted to go. I just wanted to escape the punishment. I ran to the end of the path and arrived at the banks of the River Scheldt, not far from the quay for the steamship to Antwerp. I saw the boarding school standing dark against the sky. It was a beautiful evening. The eternal fog which wrapped the village was tenderly blue. Swallows danced high in the sky. I went a bit further to the large dike where I once had walked with my parents during their visit. On both sides of the dike were walnut trees, and it started to become dark in their shadow. I didn't know what to do, so I sat down in the grass and looked at the still bright Scheldt River. All this is clear before my mind, but what was going on inside me, I don't remember. I became, it became really dark on the dike. I kept on looking at the Scheldt River, on which the ships floated by, still without lights. A wind rose. I remember how I encountered the following sentence when reading 30 years later a French novel, Le vent agité le feuillage odorant les noyers, and immediately recalled the condition in which I found myself as a boy back then. Fear caught me when I heard steps coming nearer. A man stood still. He had a cap like no one wore. It was the country constable. He just said, come on, boy, and he took me by the hand. I followed him and remained silent. At the door of the boarding school, he said something to the nun who opened the door. I didn't understand him, for he spoke a language I didn't know. The nun took me by the hand and was silent too. She took me not to the usual dormitory, but to the linen room, where on a tiny bed my pajamas were already waiting for me. She waited for me to undress and to get into bed. She didn't ask anything, but just said, et maintenant, dors bien mon garçon, after which she closed the door and turned the key. Nobody ever knew anything about this escape. The boys, I, for the boys, I had been ill. The nuns never told my parents, me neither, of course. What is this story but a story of trust? Jan van Erle was surprised that he was trusted. He expected punishment and humiliation, but the constable and the nun somehow understood what had happened. A melancholic boy had wandered off, and his escape was covered by a cloak of love. It is a case not of being surprised by joy, but of being surprised by trust. I hope uh, you will see this honorary doctorate as a token of our trust in you as an academic and as a philosopher. Congratulations.
it is now time for the official conferral of the honorary degree in arts. Nominator Professor Geert van Ekert will deliver the laudation before the honorary doctor herself gives her own word of thanks. But first, let's watch the introduction video together. De faculteit Letteren en Wijsbegeerd kent het eredoctoraat toe aan professor Honora O'Neill. En er zijn eigenlijk twee zeer goede redenen. In eerste instantie is Honora O'Neill een van de meest vooraanstaande academische filosofen van haar generatie. Zeer actief geweest in het domein van, van de ethiek of moraalfilosofie en de politieke filosofie. En bij het uitstippelen van die weg vooral ook vertrokken is van grondig wetenschappelijk onderzoek van het uiveren van Immanuel Kant. Als academische filosoof is Honora O'Neill vooral bekend als diegene die aan dat kantonderzoek een enorme nieuwe bloei heeft gegeven. Kant leest ze werkelijk als een verlichte filosoof. En voor Kant zelf betekent een verlicht filosoof zijn, in het midden van, van, van de eigen tijd gaan staan, vragen stellen die uh, betrekking hebben op actuele, in de publieke ruimte bediscussieerde thema's zoals internationale rechtvaardigheid, hongersnood. Hoe kan je een rechtvaardige samenleving constitueren als je alleen maar rekening houdt met concrete regels en principes van rechtvaardigheid? Moet je bij het interpreteren en het toepassen van die principes niet ook terugvallen op een aantal zeer klassieke morele normen zoals betrouwbaarheid, confidentialiteit, charity, het mooie Engelse woord, charity. Dus op dat vlak is Honora O'Neill zeker vernieuwend geweest. Maar de andere heel goede reden is dat zij tegelijkertijd een heel belangrijke rol heeft gespeeld als uh, publieke intellectueel. Ze is ook actief betrokken geworden als voorzitter, als lid van allerlei wetenschappelijke adviesorganen, beleidsorganen van de overheid. Ik moet een zekere melding maken van die Nuffield Commission. Dat is eigenlijk een, een wetenschappelijk adviescomité uh, dat zeer befaamd is voor haar wetenschappelijk onderbouwde adviezen over allerlei biomedische kwesties. Hè. Dus, dus op het vlak van, van, van de bioethiek is op die manier uh, Honora O'Neill ook, ook een zeer belangrijke uh, naam geworden. En het gaat natuurlijk over allerlei morele kwesties die zich stellen naarmate uh, ja, de medische wetenschap uh, ja, nieuwe mogelijkheden van behandeling ontwikkelt, uh, maar daardoor natuurlijk stoot op, op, op grenzen waar zich uh, morele vragen beginnen te stellen. Maar ook op tal van andere domeinen heeft Honora O'Neill belangrijke filosofische bijdragen geleverd. Nadenken bijvoorbeeld over de rol van de universiteiten. Nadenken over wat het verschil is tussen recht op uitingsvrijheid en free speech anderzijds. Eigenlijk is Honora O'Neill iemand die aantoont dat, dat ook filosofen van de wereld een betere plek kunnen maken. Er is in de masteropleiding wijsbegeerd aan de Universiteit Antwerpen ook een vak filosofie en samenleving. En het thema van dit jaar is vertrouwen en het belang van vertrouwen voor een goede werking van de democratie. Nu, eigenlijk is dat een thema dat door Honora O'Neill op de kaart is gezet. Dus ook op die manier reikt zij eigenlijk allerlei thema's, allerlei debatten aan waar wij in onze opleiding, in ons onderzoek mee verder aan de slag gaan. En dat is allemaal dankzij Honora O'Neill. Dear Professor O'Neill, it is a special pleasure to honor you today for your career both as a Kant scholar and as a public philosopher. To honor you today above all for the way in which you have combined these two aspects in your professional life and for the way you have given shape to what Kant called wealth philosophy, philosophy of and philosophy for the world. Dear Rector, dear Dean, dear Chairman, Dear audience, ladies and gentlemen, Honora O'Neill's work is a shining exa example of how philosophy can be taken down from its ivory tower, of how philosophy can answer its true vocation by proving what it can contribute when we deal with the pressing issues of our time. When philosophers discuss these issues, they often lapse into popular statements that are no more than bien pensant phrases. Honora O'Neill, however, deeply believes that we are in no position to live without reason, and that philosophers 
have to approach these issues with rigorous inquiry. But Honora Anil is also deeply convinced that philosophy can only be meaningful for the world if it does not cling desperately to abstract ideas either. Instead of starting from ideal concepts of goodness, justice and fairness, public philosophy has to instantiate the cases it reflects upon. It has to try to pass good judgments about concrete situations and it has to search for what we can and should do to avoid unreason. As we all know, but tend to forget too often, unreason is most of the times, if not always, the consequence of us getting stuck by holding on to abstract principles. Hence, philosophy cannot cure fanatics by fanatically insisting on ideals, but only by thinking and acting reasonably and carefully. According to Immanuel Kant, we humans do not have the resources to build conceptual towers that reach for the sky. We are left with very limited equipment, only just sufficient to build a dwelling house on earth. This image, this Kantian notion of building reason or constructing reasons is dear to Honora O'Neill. According to her, there is no such thing as an ultimate lawgiver that we can rely upon when reasoning. In her reading of Kant, even Kant himself does not refer to reason as if it were a kind of deus ex machina, as if it were obvious in advance what we would to have to claim when we appeal to reason. But that does not imply that we at least could, and time and again should also try to think and act lawfully. Here is how Honora O'Neill sees it, and I quote, we reason only if we act and think or communicate in ways that we judge make it possible for others to understand, to accept or to reject our claims and proposals. If we merely assert or assume or appeal to authorities that others do not and som sometimes even cannot follow, we fail to offer them reasons." End of quote. This conception of what it implies to think and act reasonably is a second important aspect of what it means to be a Kantian public philosopher, according to Honora Anil. As Kant claims, and I quote again, claims of reason can never be anything more than the agreement of free citizens, each of whom must be able to express his reservations, indeed, even his veto, without holding back, end of quote. In other words, vindicating reason presupposes the plurality of free citizens, and hence a fully public reasoning. Philosophy should be fully public, and hence also fully political in a particular sense of that word. That is, according to Honora O'Neill, the message of Kant's famous text on enlightened thinking. It is this notion of public philosophy that Honora O'Neill has put into practice in her exercising so many public mandates, as a crossbench member of the British, British House of Lords, as president of the British Academy, as chair of the Nuffield Foundation, or as chair of the Equality and Human Rights Commission. It is this notion of public philosophy Honora O'Neill has in mind also when she addresses some of the major challenges of our age. Allow me to illustrate this in a few more words. According to Honora O'Neill, it is not only ins insufficient, but also unfruitful to only emphasize fundamental human rights in order to promote global justice. Human rights are in danger of remaining merely manifesto rights if we do not first reflect on the corresponding duties that should be involved. Claiming that a human right is important remains empty when we do not answer the question who ought to do what for whom, in order to implement this right and to guarantee that it will be respected. Who has to do what for whom? That is, according to O'Neill, the key qu practical question in so many domains. And so we must look after for another, more effective approach to global justice, in which not only borders themselves must meet standards, but responsibilities and duties must also and especially be assumed by non-state agents of justice. If today 
There is much discussion and debate about corporate social responsibility. It is to a large extent due to Honora O'Neill's new rigorous approach to these themes. Another theme that is central in Honora O'Neill's work is trust. We simply cannot live without trust in persons and institutions in so many situations in our lives. But how should we judge their trustworthiness? Honora O'Neill not only shows that generic polls that measure trust are, as a rule, misleading, but also that strategies designed to result in ever more openness and transparency are counterproductive. Moreover, an appeal to only an abstract right to individual autonomy in the form of informed consent is not sufficient in this case either. In order to be able to put trust in an intelligent way, we need information that is accessible, intelligible and accessible and that is provided by persons or instances of whom we are able to judge their truth claims, their commitment and their competence. Hence, trust is intrinsically bound up with questions of trustworthiness and not only with abstract right, but also with classical duties such as competence, honesty and reliability on the part of those who deliver information or services, and thus also with enhancing a climate in which these duties can flourish and can receive their due. Honora O'Neill's way of philosophizing and dealing with the pressing issues of our age presupposes a robust public space that allows for the construction of reasons and principles of thought and action that can be shared by free citizens. It should therefore come as no surprise that Honora O'Neill is concerned about the fate of the public use of reason in our digital age. We live in a time in which even the powers that be can unhinderedly spread lies and remain insensitive to the truth and its importance. We live in a time in which everyone can entirely anonymously spread suspicion and even defamation and in which social media allow for the creation of echo chambers that kill one of the advantages of participating in public debate, namely to be confronted with ideas with which we disagree. Honora O'Neill's latest reflections on ethics of communication deal with one of the most critical challenges of our time, showing how the abstract right of freedom of self-expression turns out to run the risk of being a false friend of what free speech once was meant to be, and how internet services evade their responsibilities and democratic duties by claiming they only provide platforms. Honora O'Neill's fierce criticism of the public debate in Great Britain preceding the referendum, the result of which complicates and even endangers exchanges between Britain and the continent, does not come as a surprise. I can only recommend everybody to listen to the talk Honora O'Neill delivered on BBC after the Brexit vote. Dear Professor O'Neill, dear Lady O'Neill, dear Honora, today we do not only want to honor you as an eminent Kant scholar and public philosopher, but foremost for the integrity of your thought, for your most rigorous philosophical thinking and for that rare capacity for judgment that is apparent in, on, in your entire oeuvre. So for these reasons, I request that the Rector honours Professor Honora O'Neill with an honorary de degree from the University of Antwerp. Thank you, colleague. On the recommendation of the Faculty of Arts and by decision of the Executive Board, the University of Antwerp confers upon Professor Honora O'Neill, Emeritus Professor at the University of Cambridge, the degree of Dr. Honoris Causa in philosophy for her groundbreaking writings on ethical, political philosophy and the philosophy of Immanuel Kant, for the eminence of her public activities as a philosopher including her activities as president of the British Academy, as chair of the Huffield, Nuffield Foundation and of the UK's Equality and Human Rights Commission, as a crossbench member of the House of Lords and as a member of the Medical Research Council 
and Banking Standards Board, and for her authoritative contributions to public philosophy addressing issues of major public concern such as justice and borders, accountability and trust, the future of universities, the quality of legislation and the ethics of communication. Dear Mr. Nell, on behalf of the University of Antwerp and the Faculty of Arts, I would like to thank you to participate in this ceremony. Can I ask you to hand over the University of Antwerp's honorary medal and diploma of Dr. Honoris Causa in philosophy to your mother, Professor Honora O'Neill? Thank you very much. Honorary Dr. O'Neill, can I invite you to express maybe some words to the audience over, all over the world? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rector, and thank you, University of Antwerp, Thank you, Dean Duelo, and Professors Van Eckert and Van Herrick. Uh, a very warm thank you. This is a great honor. And I know that the organization of today has been a, a very complex task. And I must, in the first place, also thank Professor Van Eckert for making it quite easy for me. Uh, Honorary degrees, as we all know, are part of the ceremonial life of universities. And all too easily, that ceremonial side of our lives disappears during the pandemic. This is not easy to organize, and yet you have managed it. At first, of course, we had hoped a little delay would be enough. We tried a little delay, and things did not uh, become manageable that way. I'm aware also how very much background work this has needed for many people at the University of Antwerp and above all for the technical team who rejoice in the name of story catchers. Uh, I know that you are not visible on screen at the moment, but I'm deeply appreciative of the quality of the organization and I have to say of the uh, transmission. Uh, I do not know you all by name. I think I have only one name to hand, but my thanks to all of you. It has been a great pleasure in particular to come to know Professor Van Eckert during this process. He and I both find ourselves reflecting on how the ethics of communication is evolving in an era of unprecedented change in communication, a change that is in some ways one-sided because it is fundamentally a change in connectivity. Connectivity matters, but it is not all that matters. Like Professor Van Eckert, I have felt that there's much that we can learn from the past, certainly from Immanuel Kant, who both of us think about a good deal, but I also think about the more distant past. And during the last couple of years, I have found myself repeatedly thinking about what Plato has to tell us about the ethics of communication. Now, you may think Plato did not have to deal with the digital world, and that is entirely true. But Plato did have to deal with a te technology that was new in his time, and which is called writing. And he wrote about writing in the dialogue called Phaedrus, and he describes why uh, writing uh, can be a very difficult technology for communication, can make it harder for us to uh, judge and assess the words that we hear. He describes the written word as going, his metaphor is, fatherless into the world without any credentials, without people knowing the provenance, 
if you cannot identify where it has come from, how do you know whether it is true? How do you know whether it is trustworthy? And we have found ways in the past to deal with writing. That is to say, we have ways of authenticating. And although there was a new crisis when printing was invented, that crisis too was overcome. We have not yet overcome the difficulties that digital technologies for communication have thrust upon us. Uh, we still have the problem of many contributions which come into our lives with us not knowing the provenance. The anonymity of the digital word seems to me to be one of our main problems. I'm not going to talk about the solutions because about a hundred solutions are already being uh, suggested, enthusiastically endorsed or torn into shreds by many, many writers. But that is a problem we face, philosophers and others, and we're going to have to do something about it. So I will just finish by saying again, a very, very warm thank you to the University of Antwerp, to all of you. And this is a great honor and a memorable occasion. Many thanks. Bravo, signor padrone! Ora incomincio a capir il mistero e a vedere schietto tutto il vostro progetto. A Londra è vero, voi ministro, io corriero e la Susanna. Secreta ambasciatrice, non sarà, non sarà, Figaro il dice. Se vuol ballare, signor Contino, se vuol ballare, signor Contino, il chitarrino le suonerò. Tarino le suone rossi, le suone rossi, le suone Se vuol venire nella mia scuola, la capriola le insegnerò. Se vuol venire. La mia scuola, la capriola, le insegnerò, sì, le insegnerò, sì, le insegnerò. Saprò, 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 ma piano. Piano, piano, piano. E gli ogni arcano dissimulando scoprir potrò. L'arte schermendo, l'arte adoprando, di qua pungendo, di le scherzando, tutte le macchine rovescerò, rovescerò. L'arte schermendo, l'arte adoprando, di qua pungendo, di le scherzando. Tutte le macchine rovescerò, tutte le macchine rovescerò, tutte le macchine rovescerò, rovescerò, rovescerò. Se vuol ballare, signor Contino, se vuol ballare, signor Contino, il chitarrino le suonerò, il chitarrino le suonerò, sì, le suonerò, sì, le suonerò. Yeah.
Isn't it a wonderful to be able to enjoy some live music? Thank you to bass baritone Wilfried van den Brande, who has performed as an impressive soloist on almost every major stage in Belgium and worldwide. Thanks also to Bart Rodin's virtu virtuoso multi-instrumentalist and owner of no fewer than 24 historical keyboard instruments who played just the piano for us today. We heard Sevoile Ballare, the opening area from Mozart's La Nozze di Figaro, in which Figaro teaches the privileged aristocracy a lesson by inviting them to dance. You also uh, heard The Impossible Dream by Mitch Lee from Man of La Mancha about Don Quixote's heroism in fighting tirelessly against injustice. Let's keep on fighting it with trust, for example. I'd like to finish this afternoon by saying a few words of thanks. Thank you to Professor O'Neill for all your impressive work, for your inspiring words and for accepting the honorary degree. I'm sure that many people are looking forward to attending your masterclass in the, in the autumn. Thanks also to Professor Van Herk for his beautiful introduction. Um, thanks to Rector Herman van Goetem, to nominator Professor Geert van Ekert, to Dean Luc Durlo and the Faculty of, course, uh, Faculty of Arts. Of course, many thanks to you all for joining us this afternoon as well. Let's hope that we can once again fill the Rector Danis Lecture Hall next year and raise a glass to our honorary doctors during a, during a celebratory reception afterwards. I hope to see you then. <laughs> 